In this unit, we're going to begin learning about the Internet and the World Wide Web, which are a little bit different, and I'm going to talk about those differences. But before we talk about the Internet and the World Wide Web, I'll talk a little bit about the history of the Internet. Uh, so the, the World Wide Web, by the way, didn't come around until the, uh, till the late 80s, early 90s. Uh, we started to see the World Wide Web, which is a little bit different. But prior to that, there was a requirement to have a network that would stretch across the country. Now, in the old days... If we went all the way back to prior to the 1960s, if I had two locations in the United States, let's say one over here in Washington, D.C. on the right side and maybe someone on in uh, San Francisco on the other side of the country, if I wanted to communicate, if I wanted to have two computers communicating between those two points, I would have to have a connection between those two points. And that would be very expensive for one thing. Uh, or we could use telephone lines, and I'll talk about how that would work here in another slide. But, um, but generally, if, you know, one of, the, one of the disadvantages of something like this is if somebody were to sever that connection, we would lose the connection between the left side and the right side. And one of the, the, the reasons this became concerning was in the 1960s, the Cold War really started to heat up, right? So in the 1960s, we had the Cold War, we had the Soviet threat, uh, and the, the idea was that if the Soviets wanted to inflict harm in the United States, uh, one of the things they would want to do is sever our communication so that they, if they launched an attack, we wouldn't be able to respond to that attack. And if they were smart, they would figure out how Washington, D.C. is talking to somebody in San Francisco uh, that might be controlling nuclear weapons, for example, right? And of course, these, you know, this isn't really where these communication lines are, but you get the idea. So if that communication line were to be severed, we wouldn't have communication between these two different points. So the, uh, the, the defense um, department came up with a, uh, basically there was an organization in the defense department called the Defense Advanced Research Projects, uh, which is DARPA, and they were tasked with trying to find a way to make a more reliable computer network other than just having point-to-point -point connections. And what they came up with is instead of having connections between two computers, right, instead of having two computers that would talk directly to each other, what if you could have a software application or a program that could mediate the communication between two computers, right? So what if instead of having to be directly connected, what if that communication could go through another computer? Almost as if I wanted to send one of you a message, but in order to do that, I would perhaps deliver that message to somebody else in the classroom, and they would go and walk and deliver the message to you. And that concept really is what was the genesis of the Internet. Uh, and that was, uh, back then it was called DARPANET, and DARPANET later became... Um, ARPANET back in the 1970s, and then by the 1980s it was called the Internet, and it was transferred to commercial entities. Uh, and in the meantime, uh, DARPANET, which started for the Department of Defense, uh, later became ARPANET, which was a civilian-controlled entity. Uh, and then later, of course, as the commercial organizations started using it as well, it became the Internet. And back in the old days, you know, at first it was just the Department of Defense, and then they started sharing that concept and the network with research institutes and uh, large universities and things like that that did research with the internet until we have what we have today. Now, when you look at this map, if I were to sever many of these connections, I would still have a connection, right? So if I severed that original connection between San Francisco and Washington, D.C., I would still be able to communicate going through those other two points. And if I were to sever, you know, take those two points in the middle of the map, if I were to sever that connection directly between those two points, they would still have communication going through either San Francisco or Washington, D.C., and that's where we get the resiliency of the Internet. So the Internet is an, is an amazingly resilient network infrastructure because of this interconnected network of computers. And that's, again, that's, that's really the genesis of the Internet. So let's talk a little bit about how we can actually connect to computers, right? So we know from a, from a sort of a macro scale that the Internet is this collection of computers all interconnected. But how exactly could I connect two computers together? Now, we've talked about this a number of times in this course. And this slide's going to look familiar. This is almost the exact same slide I showed you when we talked about uh, how music, right? How we stored music in a computer. I, taught, I gave you the example of, you know, converting an analog sound into a digital signal. Uh, and I'm going to use that example again because we can use a similar concept to move data between computers. But before we get there, let's not forget, and I've come back to this over and over throughout the course, that really everything that our computers do is really just numbers, right? We keep coming back to that, whether it's ASCII codes, storing letters, numbers, and symbols, or it's mathematics, or 
uh, equations and things like that, whatever it is, it's all just numbers. So if I have a number and I can convert it to binary, right? So here we have binary digits. We talked about and we learned about early in the semester how uh, binary is just a, a different number system based on two characters. So if I have binary numbers, ones and zeros, we know that ones and zeros really could just be on and off. And if I had a copper wire connecting two computers and I wanted to send a signal from one computer to another, if I wanted to send those ones and zeros to the other computer, two computers could be connected on either side of that copper wire and I could use voltage to encode that signal, right? So over time, at certain instances of time, and you know, we would have to synchronize this timing, but we could synchronize our timing and at every clock, you know, every tick of a clock, I can send another bit by either, uh, by either applying positive voltage or negative voltage. So a positive voltage might be the number one and negative voltage would be a zero. And thus I would be sending data. Interesting little fact for you, the uh, ones and zeros are positive and negative voltage. Some people think it should be positive and zero voltage. Uh, you know, so a lack of voltage would be a zero, but that wouldn't make much sense for a couple reasons. But one of the main ones is that when there is no signal on a wire, it would be zero volts, right? And zero volts would indicate a problem. And really, this this idea of signaling with positive and negative voltage goes all the way back to the railroads. If you um, if you had a uh, uh, you know a, 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 a cable going from one railroad station to another, and back in those days they would send uh, messages to each other using Morse code on a cable, right? So they would hit the key on their desk, and it would you know it would buzz the the next uh, station, you know, so they could listen to those tones and write down the messages. If somebody wanted to rob the train. They could simply cut that telegraph wire, right? If you cut the telegraph wire, the voltage would go to zero. But if the voltage is either negative or positive, right? Negative meaning there's no, you know, there's no tone coming through the uh, telegraph wire and positive for a tone that is coming through the telegraph wire. If you were to cut that telegraph wire and it goes to zero volts, if I'm at the station down the track, I would know that the telegraph wire has been cut, right? So it's kind of a you know, so they would know that the telegraph wire was inoperable. Otherwise, they would sit there waiting for a message, thinking nobody has anything to say. But meanwhile, the other guy's trying to send the message. The train's been robbed, and they can't get the message through. So again, we use negative and positive voltage to send that signal. And this is uh, pretty much this is how we, we, we send signals to your computers. When you sit in the classroom right now, if you look in the back of your computer, uh, there's going to be a blue wire. It's called an Ethernet cable, and it's connected to what looks like a large telephone jack that snaps into the back of your computer. This is going to be on the monitor sitting on your desk uh, in the classrooms at Camden County College. Um, that wire is just copper wire in there. Now, there's eight wires in that wire. It's a special type of wire, and I'll talk a little bit about why there's eight wires in there later on, perhaps. But um, in any event, this is this is the technology that we're using for local area networks. We'll talk more about what a local area network here in a couple seconds, what that is. But one of the problems with those copper wires of encoding the signal like this with a copper wire, we only use five volts, right? It's very low voltage. So that positive and negative voltage is either positive five or negative five volts on that copper wire. If I were to stretch that wire out really long, right? So see how I stretch that wire out on my PowerPoint presentation and I were to encode that same voltage, if I were to apply that same voltage, the voltage is going to lose, that signal is going to lose its strength over the length of that wire. Resistance and inductance causes that to happen, right? So with inductance, we're going to lose that signal strength. Now, if I'm the computer on the other side of this wire and I'm trying to read that signal, it's going to get more and more difficult to read the signal the further away I am from the computer sending that signal, with the more wire it has to go through. So we have a very finite distance that we can run these copper wires to send a signal. Um, so, and that, by the way, that, that's called attenuation. I think your book actually mentioned something about attenuation and it limits the distance that we can have for our networks inside, of, you know, when we're using these copper wires. It's very fast to use copper wires and just encode the, the negative and positive voltage because we can send a signal very quickly. Um, in fact, it's not uncommon to have 10 billion bits per second uh, through, a, uh, through a copper wire. I'll talk more about speed in a little bit with these different technologies. But attenuation is, is the problem that we have you know, with, with, with distance. The second problem we have is the speed with which we can send that signal. Uh, the more attenuation you have, the weaker that signal is, the slower you have to send it because it becomes much more difficult to see that change in voltage. You know, taking a look at the second image we see here, I've, I've changed the timing here, right? The very first example, it was nice and spread out, that timing, so it's easy for you to see where it's a one and a zero. But if I asked you in the classroom, what is the, uh, 
value of the binary digit at position 7 on that uh, on that timeline down there to count all of these little you know dotted lines here to get to position 7 is much more difficult right but when i tell you to do it up at the one on the top if i ask you for the 7th position i think you could very easily see that the 7th uh, digit is a 0 right that's pretty easy to see there you can pick that up pretty quickly so our computer would have the exact same problem right so there's a limitation in the in the speed that we can send and that speed limitation is exasperated the longer the distance because of attenuation so we have a lot of problems with this technology uh, that distance is really the issue right we're very limited in that distance this technology that I'm describing is called baseband so frequently you'll hear this technology called baseband and that's when we're just sending a sig electrical signals over a wire to computers that are connected to each other and I'll talk about some other devices we might have in there as well so to get around some of those problems right so thinking about this for a second uh, when you connect your computer at home if you have internet at home uh, you know, you might be connecting to your home internet through your cell phone or something like that, but you have to have some kind of device there that gets you connected to the internet, which we'll talk about in a second. But that has to be over very long distances, right? The telephone company is not right next door to your house or your apartment. The telephone company could be many miles away, uh, up to three miles away, or the, the cable internet provider, their central offices are also going to be up to three miles away. That means we have to somehow get these signals up to three miles and the longer we stretch these copper wires, the, the more degraded that signal becomes. It becomes nearly impossible to send signals over those distances with this technology that I'm describing here. It's a very simple technology. Uh, it works well in close proximity, but it falls apart over long distances. So think back to the lesson when we talked about taking an analog signal, uh, you know, an analog sound wave, and I showed you how we convert that into a digital signal, right? And Or we can store it digitally and then turn it back into an analog signal for us to listen to music. We're going to use the exact same principle, but we're going to use that to encode data. So now if I take that those ones and zeros, right? So I have the number 180 at the top of the screen from my eight bits, right? I have one byte of data. That byte happens to be the number 180. If I plotted that point on the graph that you see here, there's my 180. I plotted that point. So the very first byte of data, now remember, with the, you know, looking up at that baseband technology, we're encoding one bit at a time. Now I'm able to take an entire byte and encode that on that graph, right? So now I've put that byte on that graph. I'm going to do the next byte, then the next byte, and so forth and so on until I have all of my bytes. Then I create a sound wave from those bytes. So here I've created a sound wave. Now, when we talked about converting music to digital files, there we're taking a sound wave of something meaningful, you know, a meaningful sound wave and converting it into digital data so we can turn it back into that meaningful sound wave. Here, we're taking meaningful digital data, right, that, those numbers, and we're turning it into just sound. Now, what is that sound going to sound like? It's probably not going to sound like anything, right? Um, you know, it's going to sound like, like white noise. It's going to sound like psh, which you've probably heard. Uh, you know, when you turn a TV on late at night back in 1986, our TVs really don't do that anymore. But if any of you remember when we didn't have digital TV yet and you tried to tune a TV to a channel that wasn't there, you get that weird noise. So it just sounds like noise, right? There's really no sound to it. But what's in that noise is that data that we're trying to transmit, right? So, so we can convert it into sound. This is one way we can do this. I'll talk about some other ways that this happens as well. But this is a very primitive way that we could turn data uh, into another medium that we could send over a longer distance. On the other side, and by the way, we call that modulation. So the process of converting our data into another medium like sound waves is called modulation. Now, if I wanted to move sound waves over a very long distance, can you think of any technologies that would allow us to do that? And I think if you think for a moment, uh, or if you turn around and look at the back of the classroom, you'll see a telephone hanging on the wall. And a telephone is a great example, right? A telephone, when you pick up the phone and you call someone, that transmits your voice over very long distances to another telephone. And in the old days, that's how we sent data over the internet, right? We used telephone lines. So you would pick up a phone, and really back in the really old days, um, and your substitute probably remembers these days, uh, you would have a telephone where you could call another computer, and you would put that telephone into a set of cups that would have a microphone and a speaker that was connected to the computer. The computer was literally talking and listening to the phone. Of course, later on, uh, we had devices that would do that automatically inside the computer. Um, and, and those devices, by the way, 
uh, were called modems, and you'll see why we call them that. So on the other side, that other computer that is listening to this signal is going to create that sound wave, right? So it's going to create the same sound wave. It's going to capture that same sound wave. It's going to capture the points on that graph, and hopefully it's going to get the exact same data that was encoded on the, uh, on the other side, and that's the demodulation process, right? And that's where the term modem comes from. You've probably heard that term modem. Uh, so modem is the process of modulating a signal uh, or modulating data into a signal and then demodulating that signal back into data. So one of the problems with telephones, right? So, you know, why don't we use telephones to send data anymore? Well, one of the problems with telephones is they're only designed to carry voice, right? Our voices uh, are basically a telephone company. Their, their original, you know, their, their initial charter when they created telephone companies and they created that technology was to transmit the human voice. So they weren't worried about, uh, you know, that, that wide range of sound. They only needed that very narrow range of sound. So anything that you try to send through a telephone, any noise that you try to send through a telephone that's outside the range of the human voice is going to get clipped off. So when we send data through a telephone line, we are very limited to that narrow band of um, that narrow band of signal that we can use because anything outside that band is going to get clipped off by the telephone company because it's not designed to carry that type of sound. Think about it. If you try to play music for your friend over the telephone, it's not going to sound very good because it's a narrow band technology. Now, if you think about it, there are other technologies in your home that have much more range of analog signals that you can receive. For example, your television. Uh, you know, the television has not only a huge range of sound that you can transmit through the cable tele, you know, the cable uh, signal, um, but also many channels of that signal. So that's a tremendous amount of range that you can get through a cable, uh, you know, through cable TV. And so that would be a broadband technology. So cable would be broadband. Your your telephone lines would be narrowband. I would hazard to guess that many of you do not use telephones to connect to the internet anymore. You might use your cell phone to connect to the internet, which we'll talk about in a few minutes, but you don't use a good old fashioned tel you know, telephone in your house uh, to connect to the internet with a modem in your computer. Um, it's older technology and it's rather slow. In fact, let's go ahead and talk about that in just a few minutes. I'll talk about these different technologies. Um, but what you might want to do is just take a moment and on your worksheet, uh, you may want to fill in a couple of the answers on the first page of the worksheet because uh, we've already discussed some of the topics on that worksheet. So you can go ahead and pause the video for a moment and, and go ahead and do that. And then we'll step into the next slide where I'm going to talk about some of the different ways we can connect to the Internet. All right, presumably you're back. So let's, let's continue and talk about the different ways we can connect to the Internet. What I just described in the previous slide when I talked about modulating and demodulating that signal and narrowband technologies like a telephone, that would be dial-up. And in the old days, if you used dial-up to connect to the Internet, because of that narrow range, you would only be able to send about 56,000 bits per second. Now, contrast that with the speed that we talked about with, the, uh, with that baseband technology, right? So those computers that are sitting in the classroom that are connected with those copper wires... Um, they can send about 10 billion bits per second, right? So they can communicate at 10 billion bits per second with the right technology. I think in our classroom, we probably don't have that. It's probably more like 100 million, not 10 billion. But the theoretical limit right now is about 10 billion bits per second. That's considerably faster than dial-up, which is only 56,000 bits per second. So this is incredibly slow. So if you still use dial-up at home, it probably takes a pretty long time to, to browse things on the, uh, on the World Wide Web, for example. Now, another technology based on telephone lines that came out a little bit later was DSL, or Digital Subscriber Lines. They used some tricks to get faster speed out of the telephone lines. Um, they used digital telephone lines, really, so that you can get a little bit more speed, and they were able to expand that range by using different uh, channels. It's a little complicated, but basically you could get 256,000 bits per second with Digital Subscriber Lines, or DSL. DSL is still around. I'm sure that some of you probably have the ability to get DSL, I know that Verizon in our area still offers it in certain areas, um, but it, they don't offer it globally anymore because there are other technologies available. Another example is cable. Uh, I think probably a good portion of you probably have cable at home for your television, and you may be using that for your Internet as well. Uh, so with cable, right now you can expect around 50 million bits per second. 
So if you take a look, dial-up was 56,000 bits per second, where cable is 50 million bits per second. So that's broadband technology. It's much faster. And then if, you, uh, if it's available in your area, around here, uh, Verizon has uh, Fios. There are other um, Fios-type services uh, that may be available in different areas. But Fios, which is another technology, this uses um, fiber optic technology. It's still a broadband technology. It still uses modulation to some extent. Um, so it basically is converting the data to light, um, which is, uh, uh, you know, so basically you can think of it as sort of um, blinking light in a, in, a, in a cable, right? And light is very fast. So Fios is about 100 million bits per second. So we can get about 100 million bits per second with uh, fiber optic, at least with, with, with consumer fiber optic that you might get at home. Uh, for businesses, it can be considerably faster. But I wanted to give you kind of a, a good sense of, of the speed you might expect to get on a standard home connection or a, you know, a, a kind of a, a standard grade business connection. Uh, there are services available with fiber optic that are a little, you know, quite a bit faster than this. Um, so that's fiber optic. So again, we've gone from 56,000 bits all the way up to 100 million bits per second. Another, uh, uh, another example is satellite. Uh, one of the problems with satellite is your upload still uses dial-up with some satellite services, although that's been, um, that's been improving over the years. Um, but it still uses uh, dial-up for, for many of these different services. I think there's a way to do it without dial-up, but it's still considerably slower for upload. Download is probably about as fast, uh, somewhere between DSL and cable. I can't tell you exactly what it is. It really depends. There's a lot of variables with satellite. And the question is, you know, if we have these better technologies like cable and fiber optic, you know, why do we even use satellite? Well, if you think about it, uh, I talked about cable, and a lot of you probably have cable at home. If fiber optic or Fios is so much faster than cable, why doesn't everybody just have Fios? And one reason for that is many of you probably can't get Fios. It's not available in all areas. Uh, it's not universally available, at least in our market. Likewise, you can't get cable and fiber in many areas. We live in a very sparsely populated country, right? There's a, you know, off in the, uh, the hinterlands of, of Kentucky, you might not be able to get fiber optic or Comcast cable or something like that. So satellite becomes your only option. It's certainly better than nothing. Um, so satellite works pretty much anywhere in the continental United States uh, and also on an airplane, right? So if any of you flown on an airplane and were able to use the internet on an airplane, you were using satellite to do that. That works through, uh, through ground based communication with satellite, uh, but it's very similar. So another, another way to connect to the internet, this is becoming much more popular today, is WiMAX. WiMAX um, is the term they use in your, in your book, but you might also hear terms like LG, or I'm sorry, LTE or 4G or something like that, which is using your cell phone, right? So it's using your cell phone. So the same service that you use for your cell phone to access the internet from your phone, um, you know, you can also use that to access the internet from other devices. You can tether other devices through your phone. You can make your phone a hotspot. I'm sure a lot of you have done that before, made your phone a hotspot and tethered devices to your phone and so forth. So that's another, another way we can connect to the internet. One thing that I want to make absolutely clear uh, here is that Wi-Fi is not a way of connecting to the internet. Wi-Fi is a way to connect to a network, but not connect to the internet. And every time I give a test on this topic and I ask uh, students to describe different ways to connect to the internet, um, they always put Wi-Fi. And I know somebody in this classroom is going to do that. So Wi-Fi is not how you connect to the internet. That's how you might connect to a network. For example, if you're at a coffee shop, you're going to connect to their Wi-Fi network, but their network is then connected to the larger, to the wider internet. And you're connecting through that network to get to the internet. In fact, let's talk about networks here on the next slide, but why don't we take a little break so you can fill in uh, some answers on your worksheet. So I'll pause here for a second. Uh, and you can pause the video and you can complete that worksheet and put in some different ways that you can connect to the internet. And we're back. So let's, uh, let's continue on and talk about networks. So when you read your textbook, they're going to talk about, first thing they're going to talk about is different network topologies. And if you look back in the old days, so a long time ago, uh, when we first started doing computer networks, the simplest way to create a computer network was to simply take a, a single wire and connect computers along that wire uh, to interconnect these computers. And this was called the bus network. It was a single bus. One of the problems with this type of network is if one of the computers stopped working along this bus, uh, 
uh, the signal wouldn't be able to get past that computer. So it would, um, you know, it would break the network. You can think of this as the Christmas light network, right? You know, when you think about Christmas lights, when one goes out, they all go out, right? And if you think about it, you know, think about Christmas time when you're putting Christmas lights up. When one of those lights goes out, how many of you, you know, painstakingly try to figure out which bulb is out? And how many of you just throw out the lights and go to the Home Depot and get another set of lights, right? Uh, most of us just buy another set of lights when they don't work. We don't go through there and try to figure out which bulb is out. Um, and, you know, it's because it, it's a pain in the neck to troubleshoot that. You don't know which one isn't working. And with computer networks, you know, we can't just throw out all of our computers because it stopped working and replace the whole network, right? So you have to go through that process to try to troubleshoot it. It's a big pain in the neck. So later on, a company called IBM came out with a slightly better idea. They said instead of having computers connected in the linear bus like you saw above, instead they would connect computers in a ring uh, where they were connected from one to the other and it would circle back around to the first computer. And this is an improvement because if, if one of these computers stops working, the other computers can still communicate, right? Because they can just go the other direction. So this was called Token Ring, and this was created by IBM back in the, uh, back in the late 1970s. Um, today, we don't really use either one of these network topologies because later on in the 1980s, they came out with a better idea. They said, well, instead of having all these computers connected to one another um, direct, you know, from one to the next, and it's sort of a daisy chain, what if all of the computers just simply connect to some kind of centralized device and they're all interconnected to that centralized device? And in this case, any computer on the network can fail. Any, any connection can fail and it doesn't break the entire network, right? It doesn't, you know, we don't run the risk of, of any kind of failure within our network infrastructure taking out half the network like we do with the ring and the bus network topologies. So this is definitely a much better way to do this. And the device that we use to interconnect these computers in what's called a star topology is called a router. So that's the device that you see in the middle. That's called a router. And that is the device that we, I'm sorry, not a router, a switch. My apologies. That device in the middle is called a switch. Uh, in the old days, we used something called a hub, but we don't really use those anymore. So I won't even mention, I don't even think your book mentions a hub, but they're very similar devices. But basically a switch is this, uh, is just a little device that all of your computers connect to and then they can all communicate with each other on the network. Uh, so that is a switch. And by the way, if you're using a wireless network in your home or a wireless network at school or work, uh, that is also a switch that you're connecting to. Uh, conceptually, it's the same thing. It's a centralized device and everyone connects directly to that centralized device. They just happen to use radio signals instead of wires to do that. Uh, and by the way, that, you know, that those speeds can typically be anywhere from 50 megabits per second up to about a gigabit per second. Um, so they can be fairly fast, not as fast as wires, but, uh, but fast enough for most of us, right? Fast enough to watch a movie on Netflix. So in any event, that's what a switch is. So a switch is what connects all of the devices on our network. It's that centralized device. And in some cases, so if you think about, you know, being at home, um, you want to connect to other networks, right? You want to be able to connect to Netflix to watch a movie or Amazon to order some toilet paper or connect to the school's website to check and see if our class is canceled because it's snowing outside, right? Um, so in order to connect to other networks, your switch at home would have to connect to a router. And that router would then connect you to other networks. So a router is a special type of computer that is designed just to interconnect different networks. Um, so a switch can interconnect computers within the same network and a router interconnects all these different networks. So it would connect you to a, to a different network, essentially to other switches. And again, this is a simplified, simplified uh, picture of how this works, but, but conceptually, this is how routers and switches work. So your computer connects to a switch, switches can connect to routers and routers connect you to the world. So and anytime we have a collection of computers that are connected to a switch, uh, we call that a LAN or a local area network. So that you know little network that you have at home that maybe you connect your cell phone to and maybe your laptop or your tablet, uh, that's going to be a local area network. You can have multiple area networks interconnected to one another. And generically, that would be a wide area network or a WAN. So continue with the theme here. One of the other things I want to tell you about is in the old days, we had uh, all networks were basically peer to peer meaning that computers all just talk directly to each other. So if you wanted to access a resource on another computer, you would have to have a user account on that other computer to access that, um, that resource. And in fact, many of you at home, if you use file sharing at home or you have like a little NAS device where you store your movies or something at home, you probably have a peer-to-peer -peer network. But 
it's not a scalable way of doing networks because if you have hundreds or thousands of users, you can't maintain uh, user accounts on hundreds of thousands or hundreds or thousands of computers on a network efficiently. So um, to get around that problem, we use network operating systems. A network operating system is responsible for providing network services to computers on our networks. And your book talks about how this works. Uh, and generically, your book talks about how if you go work for a company and you have a user account, when you sign in, you don't have a user account on the computer from which you're signing in. You have a user account on a network operating system, so you can sign in from any computer on the network. Sort of like in our classroom, you know, the, all these computers that you see in the classroom, they don't all have these different, you know, that user account that you see written on the whiteboard in the top right corner. Um, that, that user account is stored centrally. And when the college wants to change the password to access those computers, they don't come down to the classroom to do that. They could just do it on the network operating system and it instantly changes everyone's, uh, you know, password for all those computers. So it's all centrally managed and it makes it much more scalable. So again, we have a server and a client. Um, so a client uses the services of a server and a server is providing services on the network like network operating system and that we would call a client server network. So most networks that you see in the workplace would be a client server network. Your network at home is probably peer to peer and for a very small business it might be peer to peer. Anything that's less than 10 users or 10 computers generally can be a peer to peer network without too much trouble but once you get past 10 computers or 10 users then it gets a little bit more difficult to do a peer-to-peer -peer network and it makes sense to, to implement some kind of server to manage that stuff. Another type of server that they talk about in your textbook um, that I don't have on the PowerPoint here is the file server. So the one at the bottom might be a file server providing files to users on the network. So sort of a central place to store files. We have that at the college as well. Uh, you know, on your computers, there is a, a, um, there's a folder you can go to that's not actually on your computer. It's a file share. And if I were to put a file in that folder on my computer at the front of the room, all of you would instantly have access to that file from that same folder on your computer because it's actually on a file server somewhere else in the building. Um, so that's what a file server is. So why don't you pause the video here and then, uh, and then we'll pick up on the next section. Pause this to uh, go ahead and work on that worksheet and fill in uh, some of this stuff on your worksheet and then we'll continue on.